Welcome to this webinar about physiopathology of COVID-19. Let me first show you an application that you can download for Android and iOS, Guia Mensa. This is in Spanish, but maybe you can understand because during the pandemic, this application is for free and is a very nice pocket guide of antimicrobial therapy where you will find all the information that you need about coronavirus infection, but also about the treatment uh, of a coronavirus with an uh, update um, that it's almost every, uh, every day, and something that is very important in the context of this infection that every day we have a lot of different information. To understand the physiopathology here, I show you the alveoli and interstitial space with capillaries, but also different cell types, including the epithelial cells, macrophages, endothelial cells that are present in this context, and all of them are very important to understand this physiopathology. The respiratory virus in general, as you know, are infecting the epithelial cells in the alveoli and are inducing the expression of interferon type 1 or 3 that at the same time are inducing in the infected cells and in the neighborhood cells the expression of a, a, an important number of genes that are responsible of the activation of different antiviral uh, antiviral mechanisms. But in addition to this uh, process of antiviral infection that we know as an innate immunity, also these interferon products are responsible of the, uh, of the mm, uh, systemic uh, symptoms of these viral infections, like for example, fever, malaise, or uh, myalgia, among other typical symptoms of these infections. Interestingly, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, is different from influenza virus or from respiratory synthetial virus infections since the transcriptional uh, response to the infection in different uh, cells, it's quite different from one virus to the others, as you can see here. And particularly for SARS-CoV-2, what happens is that uh, there is no activation of the typical genes induced by interferon 1 and interferon 3. So the consequence is that there is no effective in, uh, uh, viral replication from the innate immunity from at least the first days of the infection. And so these patients are uh, uh, shedding quite high degree of, uh, of uh, viral particles. And secondly, and very important, the patient is not developing early the typical symptoms of the uh, illness, of the viral illness. This is important because the R0, that is, as you know, the uh, number that uh, we use to define how uh, infectious is in a specific virus. And it's defined as the mean number of new cases from a new, uh, sorry, from an index case. And we have learned that the R0 for SARS-CoV-2 uh, is about five, uh, with a 95 inter, uh, confident interval between 3.8 and 8.9, that is significantly higher than other coronavirus or, for example, influenza, that is about two to three. So preventing measures are very important. But what I wanted to uh, show you is in the in this graph, uh, in a in a paper presented by He in Nature Medicine relatively recently, where the authors show that the density of new cases regarding the onset of symptoms is, as you can see here, for influenza virus, the majority of the new cases appears 
at the moment the patient is stopped with the symptoms so from the very beginning but the majority of the new cases are coming from symptomatic cases but this is in contrast to what happens in SARS-CoV-2 where the majority of the new cases are the consequence of the infection during pre-symptomatic uh, uh, stage of SARS-CoV. Indeed, uh, according to literature, uh, literally what the author says, about 44% of secondary cases were infected during the uh, pre-symptomatic stage. This may explain in part uh, why this uh, new coronavirus is spreading quite a lot among the uh, population around the world. But coming back to the pathophysiology, uh, what is evident is that in the absence of this innate immunity at the beginning, about five to seven days appears the uh, adaptive immunity. That is mainly the consequence of the activation of macrophages in the alveoli that sense the presence of pathogen associated molecular patterns like RNA, for example, from, from viruses, but also from destroying um, uh, the, the epithelial cells appears several molecules also that we know as uh, uh, damage-associated molecular patterns that also are sensed by macrophages, by different toll-like receptors, for example, in the surface of these macrophages, that at the same time release interleukin-1 or interleukin-6 that uh, are uh, leading to activation of neutrophils, but also to activation of lymphocyte T that uh, is responsible of the activation of CD8 cytotoxic cells that recognize those infected cells by the virus, and they are responsible of destroying this, uh, these infected cells, but also to uh, stimulate B lymphocytes that finally are uh, producing antibodies that will be responsible of the uh, infection control by blocking the uh, new viral particles. So for the majority of the population, the replication of the virus lasts about seven to 10 days and probably no more than that. And the majority of the patient develop a, a non-severe infection and then in many cases is completely asymptomatic or with gastrointestinal uh, manifestations or the majority of them with signs of fever, cough, myalgia, and um, in general, the X-ray could be normal or sometimes like in our case here with a small pneumonia in the upper lobe and uh, normal uh, procalcitonin, low C-reactive protein, low leukocyte counts, and this patient was treated with antiviral agents, including Calitra, hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin, and the patient was discharged at day five with a resolution of symptoms. This is what happens in the majority of uh, young people without comorbidity, and indeed this is what happens to the majority of the population, about 85% of the population uh, infected by SARS-CoV suffers uh, in this way, but there is about 15% of the population that had a severe infection. Of course, 15% of the infected cases in just a couple of months is a lot of patients that needs to be admitted in the hospital. And what happens to this 15% of the population? It did what happens is that lymphocyte T is also uh, releasing interferon gamma. This interferon gamma stimulates also macrophages, activates macrophages. And so here we are starting uh, um, a feedback uh, a loop that uh, leads to um, uh, immune dysregulation with an activation of macrophages and activation of lymphocytes. And both together are leading to a, 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 an increase in the, in the capillary uh, leakage. And this leads to a, a typical syndrome, 
a typical distress syndrome uh, that it's uh, here represented by this occupation of the alveoli that leads also to uh, uh, severe uh, respiratory failure and consequences for our patients. Here in this slide, just showing you a simple representative of the uh, main effectors, macrophages and lymphocytes. In this loop, and we can identify this uh, activation by a simple test that is a reactive protein that is a surrogate marker of the increase in the interleukin-6. And uh, of course, we can also identify these consequences in, in some autopsies that perform, that have been performed in patients dying as a consequence of a SARS-CoV severe infection with a diffuse alveolar damage with edema and eolin membranes in the alveoli, but also microthrombosis, an important consequence of this uh, inflammatory process in the alveoli, and also megakaryocytes and hyperplasia of pneumocytes type 2 as a consequence of viral infection that we can observe uh, when we look at these epithelial cells that contain uh, viral particles you can see in this uh, ele uh, electronic microscope uh, uh, slide. So in order to understand what happens to this 15% of patients that suffer from severe infection, this is a typical case, male, 58-year-old, hypertense with um, uh, 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 an, an initial, after five days of, of uh, starting with infection, the patient is admitted with a saturation of 96%, so requiring, requiring a two liters uh, lentils with a discrete uh, lymphopenia, a C-reactive protein of six. And what happened to this patient is after three, five days in the hospital, increasing, progressively increase in the um, in the uh, uh, heart, uh, heart rate, but also in the uh, breath rate uh, with low oxygen saturation, lower uh, lymphocyte count, higher C-reactive protein, and slight increase in the ferritin level or the dimer. In addition, the patient developed in the CT scan was evident this typical uh, interstitial infiltrate bilateral suppleural. Uh, that is uh, the typical picture of these uh, patients or, or the distress of these patients. And this particular point, we decided to evaluate the influence of tocilizumab. This is an inhibitor of interleukin-6 at uh, uh, these dosages that I'm showing you here. And we compare with uh, the standard of care without the inhibition of, of, of interleukin-6. And we evaluated two different outcomes, the need of ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, or, um, or death. This is very important because the number of patients that need an, uh, a bed in the intensive care unit is very high during the pandemic. As you can see here in blue, the number of patients that require ICU admission, it's, it's clear that we needed uh, to double the number of ICU beds during the peak of the pandemic. And this is quite difficult because uh, to uh, structure the hospital to get all these beds is very, very difficult. So it's very important to reduce the number of patients that require uh, that require the uh, ICU admission. So what I wanted to show you here is the results of our study. Those patients that receive tocilizumab require significantly lower ICU admission, also require less mechanical ventilation, and finally there was a trend towards lower uh, mortality rate, 10% uh, versus 18% in non uh, map recipients. So according to our results, the block, the early block 
of interleukin-6. Uh, apparently, it's able to stop the uh, uh, the process of the uh, of the patient towards the development of severe uh, distress syndrome. Uh, in addition, the multivariate analysis um, supported that tocilizumab was significantly associated with uh, uh, a lower uh, a rate of ICU admission and death in our in our cohort. So we don't know exactly which is the importance of viral uh, of of the virus and this uh, final um, uh, immune dysregulation. We don't know if this is associated with a viral replication or is just fragments of the virus, as in other previous uh, viruses, it has been demonstrated that only fragments of the virus are enough to uh, establish this immune dysregulation. So we do, do not know exactly which is exactly the, the, the situation for SARS-CoV-2 in terms of this point, but um, we have some data uh, from different autopsies again, showing a very high uh, amount of RNA copies in the lungs and even the immunofluorescence show viral particles in, uh, in these uh, different cells, particularly in the lungs, but also in many other uh, organs like kidney, liver, heart, brain, or blood, where, uh, of course, the number of copies are significantly lower than in the lungs. So still to we need even more information to be sure that these particles are really viable viruses, but uh, according to this information, probably viral replication is playing an, an important role. So in terms of um, the uh, treatment, uh, it will be necessary to associate the viral, the um, immunological blocking uh, to associate this with, uh, uh, with an antiviral therapy. But in terms of the uh, uh, clinical manifestations of these immune dysregulations, not only C-reactive protein important, also ferritin is a good surrogate marker of interleukin-1 activity uh, that we can use and monitor in these patients. And also other uh, serum markers are important, could be uh, lympho, uh, decrease in, in lymphocyte in lymphocyte counts. This is a very important marker, but also high LDH, or uh, for example, also uh, high um, uh, uh, high um, D dimer uh, is also an important surrogate marker of microthrombosis that can help us to define uh, to define in uh, to define the presence of this immune dysregulation in our patients. So. As a conclusion, the treatment, particularly in those patients in the early stage of, of this uh, process, of this inflammatory process, the block or the inhibition of interleukin-6 with tocilizumab, salilumab, or cetuximab could be helpful. Also, other uh, inhibitors like anakindra probably are also, there are few papers supporting also the benefit of this uh, uh, of this of the inhibition of interleukin 1 with this uh, protein with anakindra also other inhibitors of check kinase like baricitinib and others could be also helpful um, but the uh, clinical experience is still limited and of course finally uh, more broad in, uh, inhibition of the uh, inflammatory process by using corticosteroid therapy could be useful. Always there is some concern about the impact of steroid therapy on viral replication. And since we, uh, we have some preliminary data supporting the idea that the virus is present there uh, at the moment of the immune dysregulation, probably we need more and more information to be sure that steroid therapy is not associated with a, a prolonged in the viral replication. And of course, an antiviral therapy to uh, uh, to help uh, to stop this uh, immune dysregulation process. Finally, only remember that in the in other webinars of this series, 
you will find information about other um, uh, complications associated with this infection, like uh, persistent activation of macrophages, particularly associated with the high ferritin levels. Second, thrombosis associated with high D dimers levels. Uh, uh, renal failure, organizing pneumonia, or uh, bacterial or fungal infections associated with this, uh, also with this process. So uh, there is uh, uh, an, uh, uh, many other uh, complications associated with this virus that we need to learn more and more. This is just a, a brief summary of the evolution of this infection in our hospital. And with this, I finish and I want to thank for your attention to this.